Revelation chapter 5 is where we are at. And I thought it might be helpful if we uh, read through uh, that chapter, since it's only 14 verses, uh, before we get started. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. To remind you of some key things again, I always put this up because I want you to understand I am not your teacher, the Holy Spirit is. Check everything I say with scripture, and if you don't, I will come and beat you with a yardstick. <laughs> All right, covered that much. Now, on to the next thing. Uh, the Father's heavenly courts, the beauty of God. We, we ended with this slide, and this is where we're picking up today. Um, so we are uh, at this... Uh, letter A in your Roman numeral 2 section. Uh, Julie, can you... All right, so Revelation 4, which we looked at last time, gives us... Uh, really the greatest revelation that we have in Scripture of the throne room of God. I mean, we've got different passages in Ezekiel, for instance. Even Isaiah, um, he sees the throne room of God and he has that whole experience of how, how sinful he is, how he needs the coals to touch his lip, to purify his mouth. Uh, but this is really the greatest revelation in that chapter of God's beauty in Scripture. What God put around himself expresses his beauty to creation. Uh, we refer to it as the beauty realm of God. We looked at those different things that are in there, the emerald rainbow and the sardius stone and all those different things, and we talked about the symbolism in chapter 4. And as we transition to chapter 5, what we're really looking at is now the plan specifically for Jesus, who he is. And today, really, if you, the, the main point that I want to get across is the humanity of Jesus. You know, none of us have a problem with understanding the deity of Jesus. Every one of us thinks very easily about Jesus being fully God. But when it comes to him under understanding that he is also fully man, we have a hard time doing that because 
accepting humanity, pla placing himself in flesh, has put limitations on him. He has to, um, even though he is still fully God, he has to operate as a human being now. Uh, being fully God, he is under the leadership of the Father and, and being guided by the Spirit. So he is not only our example, but he actually lives the way that we are supposed to live for all of eternity now. Since he roped himself in flesh, he is now fully man as well as fully God. In so, eternity. Even now, from the point where he was uh, came um, born of the Virgin Mary... That is where he clothed himself in, in humanity. Uh, and, and from that point on, throughout the rest of, of eternity, he is fully God and fully man. And he was fully God before that, but he, wasn't, he became a man when he uh, came here. So, uh, okay, paragraph B. Revelation 4, 2-7 outlines four categories of God's beauty, with each having three specific themes, total of twelve. Um, we have the, uh, the beauty of God's person, how God looks, feels, and acts. In Revelation 4, 3, He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So we looked at that. We looked at God's uh, partners, how the church is enthroned and robed and crowned together around the throne where those 24 thrones, on those thrones I saw 24 elders. Those are human beings who were sitting there on those thrones. There's numerous scripture passages and we'll look at it today with chapter 5 as well where people are uh, uh, invited by God to rule with him. It uh, goes all the way back to, uh, to Moses in Exodus chapter 19 where God prophesies over his people that he will make them a nation of priests and kings to his God, to, to our God. And then the third thing was the beauty of God's power. Uh, we had the manifestations of power and lightning and thunder and voices. So just to give us a, a, a recap on that, the beauty of God's presence, um, uh, the lamps, the seraphim, the sea, all those things are important for us to understand. Uh, as they give us really an outline um, of, of what uh, God's beauty realm looks like. Okay, I'm trying to find, there we are, that's the one I wanted to get to. Revelation chapter 5 gives us insight into the Father's plan to exalt Jesus as a human king over all the earth. Jesus coming as king to take over the nations is one of the main themes of Revelation. So we look back when we started looking at Revelation in, in verse 7 of chapter 1, we saw that is the destiny, that's the plan uh, of God to bring the earth under the leadership of Jesus Christ. He is the God-man, he's the only person who can fill the role of Messiah. And Messiah, this anointed one, that's what that word means, it is not only uh, looking at salvation, but it is looking at redemption of Mankind as well as redemption of the world. Because we have a fallen world that needs to be redeemed. We have a fallen human race that needs to be redeemed. But we also have the dominion aspect that, the, that God promised to give dominion to mankind over his creation. And that promise still stands. It will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is fully God and fully man. This is a great Mystery, it says in Scripture. In 1 Timothy 3.16, it talks about great is the mystery of godliness, of how this godliness thing works. Great is the mystery of how this whole thing operates. How we are actually redeemed. How we are made godly. How we are joined to Jesus. We're united with Him. Have you ever thought about being an equally yoked bride to Jesus? It's mind-boggling to me to think about that His desire for his people is that we would become equally yoked with him and so that we could partner completely in everything that he does. It's just a mind-blowing thing. It's a great mystery to understand uh, how godliness works. Uh, God who is uncreated and eternal, he has manifested himself in human flesh. 
that's, that's a great mystery that we need to uh, try to start understanding. We'll never have a full understanding. Billions of years from now, we'll still be baffled at how he did this and why he did this for us. It stretches our mind beyond comprehension. Uh, Jesus had to become human. It, it, was, it was ordained at the point where God said, we are going to create the earth, we're going to create creatures on it, we're going to place man in our image. From that point on where God purposed that in his heart, there had to be a plan of redemption and Jesus had to choose to say yes to clothing himself in humanity, to becoming fully human. Uh, he has to be human forever. If he at, ever, at any point said, uh, this was a fun ride, I'm done being human, I want to not be that anymore, then the whole plan of God would fall apart. Uh, God would be an unjust God. He would have unjustly sent Satan into the lake of fire. Um, everything God does has to be done according to righteousness and holiness and justice. And so Jesus will forever be a human. He chose that before the earth was even uh, founded. Scripture tells us that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. That was purposed in the heart of God. That's what's going to have to take place. And he still went through with his plan to create humans, even though he knew they were going to rebel against him and send his son to the cross. So there, um, it's, it's a very costly thing to think about the limitations of Jesus' humanity. Jesus forever can only be in one place at one time. Have you ever thought about that? We, think about this for a minute. We actually, we, we do a big mistake with how we lead people to salvation. Uh, we oftentimes say, uh, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Well, Jesus doesn't come into your heart. The Holy Spirit is given as the gift, the down payment, the deposit of our faith. So we actually cannot ask the Holy Spirit to come into our heart. That is something God does. He gives the Holy Spirit to us. What we have to do, and here's where the problem lies with, I think, with our Western Christianity. We actually have to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the difference. We submit to the Lordship, and He sends His Holy Spirit into, into our life. So His Holy Spirit is what is everywhere. What, you know, Jesus, He is fully God under the, the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit here. The Holy Spirit is able to be everywhere at every time. Jesus, because He took on flesh, He is only able... Yet he's limited in that way. He's only able to be everywhere through his spirit. But physically, he is going, when he's going to be on the throne in Jerusalem, he's not going to be walking in the park in New York with somebody at the same time. He is limited by that because he took on flesh. He is still fully God because he fully operates through the, the Father and through the Spirit. They are all one. So it's, it's a mind boggling thing. I can see some of you are thinking about that. Well, I've never thought about that. But that is, that is what I'm trying to get across to you with this chapter 5 here. Jesus becoming human made a huge impact on him and a very big difference from what it was like for him before he became human. Do you have a question? But, but when he sends the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to be within us, in essence, since he is of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. so then the essence of him is there through the Holy Spirit. Is that it, right? It is one God, three persons. Okay. So the three persons have different roles that they fulfill and different responsibilities that they have. So yes, the Holy Spirit is fully God. He is together with the Father and the Son, fully God. Um, but even as his, his person, as the Holy Spirit, he is fully God as well. It's, it's again, it's part of that great mystery, understanding who God is and how he works. We're never going to have that understanding. Okay. But we do know the Holy Spirit is the gift that God gives, uh, is given to every believer, and he resides within the believer. We also know Jesus became fully man, 
and he is limited by that, and so therefore he is not in thousand places at the same time. He is a literal man with a resurrected body that lives his life in obedience to the Father under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So it, it's, it's complete uh, amazing dynamics that Jesus placed himself under. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about this. It, it'll, it'll hopefully get a little bit more clear, but I'm not sure that it will because an hour to just talk about that is not enough time. So, but anyway, um, so the Father, he promised to exalt Jesus because of his faithfulness in his humanity. So Jesus willingly placed himself into that limitation forever. Jesus in his person will be in one place at one time. By his spirit he can touch all of us and be omnipresent. But when Jesus is on the throne in Jerusalem or wherever he happens to be at that time, he will be there. He's not going to be somewhere else as well. He will know what's going on through his spirit. Uh, just like when, when he talked to the, um, uh, uh, which, which disciple was it when he called? He said, I saw you under the tree. Oh, yeah. um, I forget which one that was. But anyway, I saw you under the tree and, and uh, uh, the disciple immediately says, wow, you are the Messiah, right? Jesus, even when he walked here 2,000 years ago, he was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, fully God but fully man as well, with limitation. He wasn't there under the tree, but he was there by his spirit. So I'm hoping that's starting to make sense. Yes. I'm not preaching a heresy here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so God promised Jesus something. He said, in effect, if you become a man, if you become human, you have to be human forever. If you obey me, I will exalt you high above all other humans. Um, that sounds like uh, uh, an amazing thing, being exalted above that, but it's actually still a step down for what Jesus had before he became man, right? So he is exalted above all men, uh, above all humans. Uh, God is exalting a human being in the earthly realm. It's actually an amazing thing if you think about that. Jesus being fully God and fully man, he's being exalted in the earthly realm. Um, he, uh, Philippians 2 in verse 9, it talks about uh, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every other name, right? Uh, Jesus, his name is above every other name. We, we actually we sing that a lot. We pray that. We, we know that his name is above every, every name. But it is his, God has exalted his humanity that places his name above every other name. So it's, it's a, an amazing aspect to understand what God has done here. He will have the greatest name that any human being has ever had on the earth. Um, again, it sounds awesome, but from where Jesus started, it's actually a step down. So Jesus really emptied himself when he came. He really uh, chose something amazing to walk in humility, to lay down his glory that he had with the Father. Uh, if you read the prayers that Jesus prayed in John chapters 14 through 17, you'll see some of his heart and what, what took place there, how he, he laid that aside for our sake. It's just a, an amazing thing. Uh, God gave the dominion, paragraph D, uh, he gave the dominion, the authority of the earth to Adam as a representative of the human race as an eternal stewardship. Now we've talked about this a lot in our Genesis study. Uh, I want to remind us of it again though. When God said, you will have dominion over the earth, that was an eternal contract with humanity. That was God's purpose looking towards eternity. Jesus had to become a man to redeem that. Um, so to reverse this decision would be injustice and failure to keep his word. God, one of his characteristics is that he is faithful. He keeps his promises. And he promised dominion to mankind over the world. And so um, uh, he keeps that promise. And uh, that's why Jesus had to come, become a man. Because the earth has to be won back by a man. So the essence of this is in Genesis 1.28. Um, and uh, Satan took the leadership of the earth... Uh, because of his uh, 
uh, deception when he deceived Eve um, and, and Adam rebelled, he, Adam actually handed it over to Satan. God did not hand it over, but Adam had been given the responsibility and he rejected that, gave it to Satan. And now Satan is called the God of this earth um, and the, uh, the ruler of darkness. So he, he physically has rulership over this planet. He actually has rulership over the nations. That is going to change when the tribulation starts. That's why the judgments will be so severe, because it's a judgment on darkness and on iniquity. Um, okay, God gave the realm of the earth to man. God would never ever take it back, because he would be breaking his word to Adam when he gave them dominion. Uh, in Psalm 115, verse 16, it says it really clearly. It says, the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earthly realm he gave to men. God says uh, that the earthly realm, uh, he will govern through humans who obey me. So that's his desire. Even when we look back at Moses, when, when Moses encounters um, God on Mount Sinai, he essentially says the same thing. I'm looking for people who will obey me and I will make them a kingdom of priests, a, a nation of priests, a kingdom of priests, and uh, kings unto our God. So uh, that's been his, his heart ever since uh, Israel became a nation. Okay, it's a staggering decree. Uh, he's going to use humans forever and ever. Uh, whenever he wants to do something on the earth. <laughs> See, we, we don't think about that aspect very often. That we think of God as the guy who can do anything with the snap of his fingers. And yes, he can, but he chooses not to. He chooses partnership over his power. Isn't that amazing if you think about that? You know, oftentimes we pray for things thinking, oh God, you can just do this. You can do it right now. And yes, he can do it right now. He can, I mean, there's all kinds of people we could pray for to be healed from sickness or to uh, get saved or whatever we want to do. Uh, we can ask God. We know he is capable of doing it. But he chooses, more often than not, partnership with humans to do something amazing for his glory. Uh, that's, it's an amazing thing that God does. He's bound himself to lead the earth with this kind of arrangement. If you think of what Jesus is going to do, the throne that he's going to establish, the millennial kingdom that he's going to take, he's going to take a thousand years to prepare the earth to hand it over to the Father. Uh, the thousand years, he's going to use human processes to rebuild everything that was destroyed, to restructure all of the evil systems that the world uh, has created. Uh, it says In scripture it says, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So what things cannot be shaken? What cannot be shaken? There's only one thing. Whatever is on the rock, whatever is built on the rock, that cannot be shaken. And that is things that are in righteousness, in holiness. So uh, godly things that are taking place on earth will not be shaken. But everything else can be shaken and will be shaken. It will be destroyed. Uh, imagine Jesus essentially is taking on the responsibility as one man to cleanse the entire earth of everything that is wicked of everything that is evil, everything that resists God, and of everything that is not done in righteousness. It's going to take a thousand years to rebuild this thing the way that it's supposed to be. He's not going to snap his fingers and it's all done. He's going to use human processes because he has chosen to limit himself with humanity. Uh, oftentimes we don't think about that. We, we think about, okay, well, why, why this thousand year time? You know, what is the purpose of that if we're starting eternity already anyway? <laughs> well, yes, eternity is, is in the heart of the believer. E eternity is when we get saved. We are eternal beings. We will live forever. But this thousand years is a determined time for Jesus to rebuild the earth under his human leadership 
There will still be humans alive. Not all people will have been saved at that point. There will still be uh, uh, people that have not chosen the Antichrist, but have also not chosen Jesus yet. There will be humans still alive. There will be the resurrected saints, because we've been raptured uh, at the seventh trumpet. We've been raptured. We will be with him forever. We will have resurrected bodies, but there will still be humans here who do not have resurrected bodies, who are not saved yet, and who are going to uh, live throughout this thousand year period that we will help govern, we will be kings over them and rulers, we will help uh, uh, rebuild things, and then at the end of that thousand years, Jesus is going to hand over this finished earth to the Father's leadership. And the Father, again, is going to to have... I mean, we, we actually don't know exactly what's going to take place in eternity because that, that part of the book hasn't been revealed to us. But we know that at the end of Revelation, when you read it, Jesus gives over the earth to the Father. The Father comes down and resides with mankind for all of eternity. It's, it's an amazing thing. So that kind of gives you an idea of why this thousand year, what's the purpose of the thousand years. Okay. By sinning, Adam forfeited his authority to Satan. Jesus came to win back the dominion given to humans. Jesus, as the last Adam, won the rights to the dominion of the earth. Have you ever thought of why Jesus is called the last Adam? It's because of this transaction that takes place. Jesus uh, won the right to have dominion over the earth because of what he did for us. And he won the right, he's the only one worthy to take the scroll, to take the title deed of the earth and the battle plan to cleanse the earth. Um, he is taking back that dominion. That is why he is called the last Adam. There is no one that is going to come after him that can take that dominion over the, over the world. Uh, he is the last Adam. Uh, the devil offered Jesus the kingdoms of the earth, if you remember, when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, and 40 nights he was tempted. One of the temptations was the devil took him up on, on the temple to look out and said, I'll give you all of these kingdoms. Uh, it was his to give. He was legally allowed to offer the kingdoms to Jesus at this point. But Jesus said, I'm not going to take a shortcut. My father has already ordained how I am to take leadership over these kingdoms. I will not bypass the cross for this. Uh, if Jesus had, had um, given in to Satan here, there would be no hope for humanity. Satan would be the eternal ruler of this, of this planet. It's, you know, if you think about that for a sec, that'll, that'll kill your joy. All right. So, um, it looks like the Great Tribulation is going to be troubled. Would you agree with that? If, if you've read ahead, <laughs> then you probably will agree it looks like trouble. Um, but actually, what is happening there is that God is using the least severe means, the least severe means, to reach the greatest number of people at the deepest level of love. Okay, I'll say that again. The least severe means is what God is using to reach the greatest number of people at the deepest level of love in order to regain the authority over the earth. So if you think about that for a minute, you look at the judgments like, wow, okay, there's, there's a few billion people that die in this one judgment, and then there's a few billion that die again, but it's still the least severe means. God is completely just in what he is doing. Nobody will be able to accuse God of being unjust. It's an amazing thing. You know, people today, they, they have all kinds of ideas about God. They always say, how can a loving God do blah, 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 blah. Well, they haven't seen what a loving God can do yet. They really have not. If you think a few hundred thousand people dying in a, in a tsunami is, is, is a horrible thing, wait until a few billion die. And then people will say, how can a loving God do that? But he is using the least severe means to wake up people at the deepest level of love. It's an amazing thing that God is doing here. So, and we will be the ones who are going to declare that to the nations. We, that's why I have such a problem with people that, that say the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation starts. Who's going to preach the message? 
what hope would there be for humanity? How would anybody get saved? I mean, I know that Left Behind series, and they figured it all out how to do it. You know, there's the videotapes in the library. You go get the videotape. And you go, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen that way. You can believe it if you want to, but it's just not going to happen that way. So, um, all right. Let's see. Let's keep going. <laughs> Jesus takes the scroll from the Father's hand. As Jesus is commissioned, he takes the scroll from the Father's hand in verse 7. This scroll represents the title deed of the earth and the action plan necessary to prepare the church as a mature bride who partners with Jesus to bring in the harvest and judge the Antichrist's worldwide empire as a key part of his plan to drive evil off the planet. Okay, so he takes the scroll here. Um, God is commissioning Jesus. We see the plan that God has for Jesus. Um, uh, commissioning is sending out. It is it is placing a, a a purpose in the heart of the person that is being commissioned. It's not God commissioning God. It is God commissioning a man. We would never think of it being an amazing thing for God to exalt God or God to commission God. But God is himself. He, he doesn't send himself away. He knows his purpose. He's commissioning a man. He's commissioning Jesus, who is fully God and fully man. So um, our problem is not so much that we struggle with Jesus as God. Our real struggle is understanding his role as a man in the age to come. Um, it's easy to imagine God being over everything. It's easy to imagine. But when you when you start thinking about a human being in charge of everything, that challenges our thinking. Uh, it's a fascinating re reality. Okay. Um, the scroll represents the title deed of the earth. A man has to hold title to the earth, even though the earth belongs to God. God has given the responsibility of dominion over to man. Uh, there is only one man who can uh, own this right, this responsibility, and that is the last Adam. He's going to, uh, God is delegating his authority and giving people who are in relationship with him stewardship over the land. The Father gives the title deed of the earth to Jesus as a human king. He is the only man with the ability to govern the whole world and lead all its governments. He is the only one found worthy, deserving, and capable to take the scroll from the Father. And in taking the scroll, Jesus accepts the responsibility to cleanse and rule the whole earth. So this, this scroll that he is taking here, it's, it's an amazing transaction that happens if you... If you look at uh, uh, what it says in the scripture and then look at uh, chapter 6, how he starts opening the scroll, but there is, this scroll is so, um, so important, so uh, highly valued by God, uh, so protected by God, that they scour the entire earth, the entire heaven, and even under the earth. So everywhere has been looked for, and there is only one person who was found who was able to open this scroll. Uh, it, it is a, a legal document that can only be opened by this one person, Jesus, the God-man. Um, this scroll needs to be opened. It, has, it contains the master plan of what God desires to do to cleanse the earth. Um, it needs to be unrolled, and we will see as we get to chapter 6, the first thing that happens is the Lamb takes the scroll and opens one of the seals. Uh, I was kind of uh, surprised a few years ago. Uh, I heard somebody uh, preaching on this passage, and they were saying how the majority of believers do not know who opens the scroll. Who releases the judgments on the earth? And so I thought that was a little strange. And so I went and asked some people in the church that I was pastoring. And sure enough, they had no idea who opens the scroll. I'm like, but it says it right there in verse 1. Why, why the question? The question comes because people say, well, how can God do such terrible things? Right? How can he be the one who releases judgments? 
But the judgments, they aren't on the people of God. They are on the Antichrist and his kingdom. They are on, on his dominion. So it is a judgment on wickedness. And uh, he is, Jesus is the one who opens the scroll. He's the only one worthy to do that. Um, so chapter 6 through 19 in Revelation is really the action plan of what is contained in this scroll, along with it being that, uh, that title deed, that master plan uh, of God's redemption. Uh, okay, paragraph C. To open the seals means to release the judgments in the book of Revelation, to cleanse the planet from evil, and to restructure all the governments of the earth. So he took the scroll to open the seals because that is what Jesus is going to do. Um, he, he will open the seven seals, then will come the seven trumpets that are, uh, that are released, and then the bold judgments, and we'll talk about those in the next few sessions. Each one of the seals releases judgment through the church against the kingdom of darkness. Remember how we talked about uh, the parallels to um, uh, Egypt and Moses, and how Moses is the one who uh, God told him what to do, and he went to Pharaoh and released the judgments, and then he uh, took the judgments back when Pharaoh was ready to say, can you stop that now? <laughs> I'll let you go, at least, for five seconds. Um, so we, uh, we get to partner with God in this, in releasing these judgments. Each one of those seals uh, releases a judgment. Uh, Jesus breaks the seals, it means he's taking the responsibility of loosing the judgments. So, um, Jesus is the one who's breaking them. Just keep that in mind as you are reading that. It, it gives us a whole new understanding of the heart of God, what he wants to do here. Um, remember, Jesus said in the, in the Gospels, he said, Blessed is he who is not offended by me. There will be Christians who are offended by what God is doing. There are Christians alive today who are offended by what God is doing. Uh, especially when something hits home, when someone in your family dies. There's, there are so many people who just have a real hard time understanding why would God allow for my wife to die, or for the husband to die, or for you know something very personal. But we have to understand that God is bigger than our understanding. And we need to trust his leadership over our lives, just like we will need to trust his leadership over this master plan that he has to bring redemption. Uh, we need to understand his heart, understand who he is, and why he does things the way he does, that we won't have an offended heart. Uh, paragraph D, Jesus is the only man with the wisdom, love, humility, and power to open the seals, to release the judgment in a way that produces righteousness and love across the entire earth. Uh, people have a tendency when some disaster strikes to look for answers from a higher being. That's just something that God has placed within us. Whenever, I, I always think back to September 11th, everybody remembers where they were and what they were doing when, when the airplanes hit the towers. And from that point on for the next month, everybody was talking about God. Everybody. Everybody was, was, the churches were filling up, there were special services that were being held, uh, there was the billboards, all the billboards had pray for our nation, God bless our troops, and blah, 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 everything about God. A month later, it was all forgotten. But when tragedy strikes, people's hearts are prepared, they are, um, uh, they are in tune with wanting something bigger than themselves because they feel helpless, which is understandable. Jesus is the only man with enough wisdom with enough humility. Uh, and again, think of humility in this context of him emptying himself of his glory and coming and, and making himself limited by his flesh. That is, that is the true definition of humility. You can't get any more humble than that. Um, so enough wisdom, enough humility, enough love to open the seals of judgment in a way that's going to produce that righteousness. Jesus is going to take on all of these areas in every nation of the earth. He wants to produce that righteousness uh, that drives him. He wants to produce that wisdom and that humility, a, a, a total lifestyle change from what the world is used to. That's what he desires to produce on this planet. Okay. Um, let's keep going. 
Was there? Yes, there was. E. Jesus has the fierceness and fearlessness of a lion and the tenderness and humility of a lamb. Um, when, when you think of those two creatures, a lion and a lamb, they are pretty much diametrically opposed, right? So think of it in context of what are their characteristics, what are their strengths and their weaknesses. A lion is known to be fierce and fearless, right? I mean, lions, they, they, there's a reason we call them the king of the jungle. It's because they dominate everything. Other animals are afraid of them. They don't have fear of those other animals. They attack them. So Jesus has that fierceness and that fearlessness that he needs to an extreme to be able to accomplish this plan. But at the same time, he has the humility of a lamb. A, a lamb is, is some, something that gets led to where it's supposed to go. It is something that is weak. Uh, it is something that uh, it is um, fragile. It, it's, it's the great picture of that humility. And this is what Jesus has in extremes, these two characteristics. He is perfect for the job. He has that tenderness and that humility and the fierceness and fearlessness uh, that is required to be able to accomplish uh, the Father's purposes here. Uh, Jesus is worthy. We trust his leadership. To be worthy is to be deserving and capable to open the seals of the scroll and rule the earth. The four living creatures, which are angelic, and the 24 elders, which are human, agree with the great love song that Jesus is worthy, and they agree with the Father's decree to give Jesus leadership of the earth. So there is an agreement in the heart of those who are watching what is taking place in the throne room of God here. They agree that he is the one who is uh, worthy to be able to do this. He laid aside his glory. He became human. Uh, he has proven that when he has all the power and all the glory, he uses it for love. Think about that for a minute. He, he chose love over his power, over his glory, over his might, over everything that he had before he became man. He chose love over that because he loves the world. It brings a whole new dimension to for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? It's a whole new dimension to understand what God did there. He has proven that he has um, that, that, uh, that will to do everything for love. Um, he will use it for love. He will use it for obedience to the Father. Uh, we can be confident in uh, the future because we know what he did in the past. Um, okay. Jesus is worthy. There are three different applications to this. First, Jesus is worth it. The devil seeks to stir up self-pity in us by telling us that we are getting a bad deal from God and that it is no longer worth the trouble to seek God with diligence. The devil essentially says, give in and give up because it's too hard. Paul's response is the excellency of Jesus was to give all to him with extravagant love. So um, Satan is, is very capable of speaking lies to our mind uh, telling us that uh, it's not worth to press into the heart of God, but the opposite is true. We need to understand that Jesus is worth it. Uh, he, when we say you are worthy to take the scroll, we're saying you are worth the, uh, the, the danger, you are worth the life change, you are worth the focus change and the purpose change in my life, you are worth it because I know who you are and I know what, you, what your desire is towards me. So it is worth obeying Jesus. Uh, the second thing is Jesus is capable. So when we say you are worthy, uh, we are saying he is capable to drive evil off the earth and reorganize all the governments. Again, think through that. that this is an amazing concept that Jesus is going to take ownership over restructuring the entire planet. And we're not talking about just 
one town or one state or one nation. We're talking the entire planet that he is going to restructure everything. And there is going to be resistance. That is why these judgments are so intense. And that's why there's so many battles that are going on. That's why we have the, uh, uh, the armies that gather together at Armageddon to fight against Jesus. It's because they want to resist these changes that Jesus is going to bring. As, as these events unfold in the tribulation, uh, we're going to be preaching as, as the church of God we will be pre preaching very clearly that Jesus is going to cleanse the earth of wickedness of selfishness and all these things and the people will stand in resistance to that there will be a great, uh, a great outcry against establishing righteousness but we trust his leadership we say that he is worth it and we say that he is capable to do it and third, we say that he deserves it. The Father will give the leadership of the earth to Jesus as he gave it to Adam. Jesus has proven himself by making every choice in love and in righteousness. So he deserves it. He has total power and he is totally pure. He has proven it. 2 Corinthians 8 9 uh, says that when he was rich, when he had all the power, being fully God, he laid aside the privileges of his deity in order to work for our good. So that proves to us in what he did and how he showed himself and the things that he did. It proves to us that he deserves uh, to take the scroll and to lead this campaign of establishing righteousness once again. Uh, paragraph C, Jesus being slain. He had to become human and live in obedience and dependence on the Spirit. Jesus had to become human forever to qualify as a sacrifice for humans. Jesus lived in perfect love, in humility, and in righteousness to qualify to bear God's wrath. Uh, Jesus had to go through the 33 years that he lived here on earth to prove that he was able to take the punishment for us. Oftentimes we, we don't think of that aspect. Of, it says in scripture that um, Jesus, as he was growing up, he grew in wisdom and in stature, right? And it says that he was tempted in every way that, that he could be tempted. Uh, he went through this 33 years as a man, being tempted, but withstanding it with perfect love and with perfect obedience to the Father, with perfect guidance through the Holy Spirit. Uh, he proved that he is the one who is capable of taking this, uh, uh, our punishment, of redeeming us. Uh, he's the only one who could possibly do that. He was able to bear the wrath of God on our behalf. Jesus being slain, he had to become human and live in obedience, dependence on the Spirit. Jesus lived dependent on the anointing of the Spirit. Ever since the Incarnation, Jesus has never ever been less than God. But he has lived as though he was never more than a man. Hmm. You ever thought about that? He's never been less than God. But when he lived here, he lived, never lived as though he was more than a man. He relied on the guidance of the Father and his Holy Spirit. That is how we are supposed to live. He was the perfect example for us. And so he, um, uh, he embodied what his desire is for us. When he says, I want an equally yoked bride, he's already showed us how that's supposed to take place. We're supposed to be in unity with the Spirit. We're supposed to be asking him. Uh, you know, I, I even recognize tonight how uh, just that sitting that hour in the presence of the Lord and, and just reading his word... I just noticed how much God wants to talk to me all the time. And, and I keep on having revelations like that. Whenever I take time just to sit with God, He desires to pour into me. And that's what Jesus showed us. He, his priority was uh, spending time with the Father in prayer, in, in that communion, that fellowship with God. And, uh, and then it was teaching others to do the same. That was the two things, essentially, that Jesus did, right? That's what he did for, for his time in ministry. And then he went to the cross for our sake. So those 33 years on earth, he lived in dependence on the Spirit as a man. 
You waited on the Father in prayer and obedience for Him to release the Spirit every time. Every time. Jesus even said, I do nothing apart from the Father. Nothing. Not one thing. <laughs> That's how we are supposed to be living. How are we doing on that? Yeah. The humility of Jesus is beyond our understanding in His humanity, anointing, and intercession. So, I hope you're getting a little bit of a picture. I know this is this is a topic that we are woefully unfamiliar with, the humanity of Jesus and what He did. Um, but I hope you're getting an understanding of, of His humanity and the anointing that comes uh, because of His uh, his obedience to the Father. Um, he is the one who uh, can perfectly intercede for us because he knows who we are and what we are capable of in, in all aspects. Okay, um, the Father gives Jesus an unprecedented measure of favor over seven different spheres of leadership. Uh, it talks about, in, in uh, these verses in chapter 5, it, it talks about power, uh, which is political. Jesus will receive governmental leadership over all the nations. He will have a literal throne. He will have literal leadership over these nations. Um, and he, will, he receives that power from the Father. He receives riches, which is financial. All the money on earth will be under Jesus' leadership. We are still going to have an economic system under Jesus. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be perfect. He's going to establish it in righteousness, but there's still going to be human processes that take place. And we will, uh, uh, I, you know, he, he receives riches. It says, it says over and over in, in Scripture that uh, God is the one who holds all riches. So uh, it's something that's valuable to God as well, the treasures that we lay up for ourselves in heaven. Um, so Jesus receives those riches. Um, he receives wisdom, which is intellectual. Jesus will replace every evil government on earth with new leaders and laws, along with restoring every sphere of life, which is political, economic, family, educational, agriculture, media, technology, environment, social institutions. Now think about that. That's going to be awesome. We can watch any movie we want to and be sure that it is in righteousness. <laughs> it's going to be great. And we can go on uh, all kinds of internet websites and never have to worry about pornography or anything like that. So it would be awesome. He's going to attack all of those fears of life. Uh, we will never ever have to discern again whether a political leader is a deceiver or not. <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, strength is the fourth thing he receives, which is emotional. Uh, Jesus will have strength in his inner man. Ephesians 3.16. I'm not sure, have we taught that one to the kids' choir yet? Uh, there's one of one of the apostolic prayers. You know, there's, there's certain apostolic prayers in Scripture. We have prayers report, recorded in Scripture that the apostles prayed. And one of Ephesians 3:16 is one of them praying for strength in the inner man through through his might, through his spirit. So as to continue steadfastly as he restores the nations and contends against all resistance. I mean, think about that. If if he were on an emotional roller coaster like I am. <laughs> <laughs> then he wouldn't accomplish very much. You know, it would be pretty sad. Um, so he has emotional strength to be able to handle accomplishing all these things. And then uh, glory, which is spiritual. All will boast in Jesus with loving delight and joyful trust. Uh, Paul gloried in Christ Jesus. Children glory in their father. Young men glory in their strength. And we glory in God's name. So he receives that spiritual strength, that glory. Uh, all are going to boast in Jesus. It's, it's a, uh, something the Father gives to him. We will recognize it and we will agree with that. And then we have the last two, honor, which is relational, and blessing, which is social. Uh, honor, Jesus will be greatly respected and listened to in all the nations. Uh, I thought the dictionary uh, definition of it was really good. To publicly esteem by showing unusual respect to one with superior standing and to listen to their words with reverence. That's what we should be doing now already. Uh, if, you, if you think about that statement that I just said, that's what we should be doing now already. Why didn't I say that's what we are doing? 
because most believers don't know everything that's in here. And we need to get um, get literate in the scriptures so that we can stop offending the heart of God by our actions and by uh, the things that we let come out of us, whether by word or by deed. Uh, blessing, all will willfully cooperate with his leadership. Oh, I long for that day. <laughs> to willfully cooperate with his leadership, resulting in the mightiest workforce in history. Uh, just think about the unity that will be there, uh, obviously with, with the resurrected saints, but even the unity amongst those humans who are still alive during the millennium. Uh, the leadership over them is going to be a perfect leadership. There's not any accusation that can be brought against the redeemed in their leadership, because we will be in unity with the Spirit. Uh, so even even though there there will still be resistance, because we know at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released one more time to sift the nations, and he takes uh, a large number of people follow him, and they are uh, they are judged, they are sent into the lake of fire, and Satan is at that point as well. So there there will be resistance, even though there will be perfect leadership. It's actually a, a mind-boggling thing, but the human heart is, um, as it said in our Genesis study, uh, every intent of the heart is wicked uh, from our youth. So it's uh, proved all the way to the end. 